for being here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I mean, I don't... You all just heard me about a week ago. Um, and so, uh, because I gave my, my talk, my presentation to the to uh, town meeting. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we just came off from our town meeting break, if you can call it that. Um, and uh, so I thought... Unless you have specific things you want me to go over that we've been working on, uh, we could just open it for questions today. Well, we do have a couple of people that are new here yeah. that I think have new ideas. Yeah. Jump right in. Greg is here. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you are, I mean, I can, I can just give the, the briefest of, of overviews. I mean, so, so we started this legislative session uh, <coughs> actually in, you know, in sync with, with the governor in that we... The, the goal was uh, affordable housing and public safety and um, workforce development and and then a few other other priorities but those were really kind of the biggest ones basically housing jobs and and, and, and uh, helping with some of the problems in the policing uh, world um, and and so there have been a lot of committees that have been working on those pieces uh, the judiciary uh, committee, you know, has been working on ways to make it easier for for the judiciary process to work. Uh, part of that is that uh, that the uh, confirmation of judges can can be a long, arduous process, and and so they're trying to streamline that process just so we get more judges in. Because part of the reason why people get turned back out on the street. You know, is because you know they get arrested for for a crime, and then it takes, uh, you know, they, they get an arraignment date of six months down the road, and um, so they let them out, and then and there are certain folks that then recommit a number of crimes, and so the sooner you can get them in the process, have the judiciary working, that 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 will assist with that. Another piece that the judiciary committee though has done is is part of that problem too is that uh, the difference between nine hundred dollars. If, if you commit a crime, and it's $900 or less, uh, or maybe it's less than $900, $899, um, it's a misdemeanor, and they basically, you, you know, they, they write you, give you a citation, let you back out. And if it's over $900, then it's a felony, and it's a bigger problem. And what we often see is uh, in these small towns, especially if it's drug-related issues, you know, so it, it's some level of petty larceny, you know, it's it's stealing a little bit of this or shoplifting that or something like that. And none of them rise to nine hundred dollars. So they're all misdemeanors. So they are all treated as separate lesser than crimes. Um, so one of the bills that the judiciary passed this uh, this session so far, I don't know if what the Senate's done with it, but uh, is to aggregate those. If within a certain period of time uh, you commit X number of, if you, if you commit three $300 crimes, it now is a felony. It crosses that line of 900. And so that those people then go into a, uh, more likely to be incarcerated for a while, that, that kind of stuff to kind of move that, that process along to put them uh, going. And so, so that they have you know, a process around that. Um, i trying to think, there was another judiciary thing that popped in my head. Uh, oh, uh, a bill around uh, actually making it uh, a crime. Right now, it's not a crime uh, for someone to get into your car and go through your car as long as they don't steal anything. <coughs> and and so, so they want to change that, obviously. Uh, but you know, and where they've hit the thing is, is, is you have to write that law in such a way that I don't know about you, but there have been times when I especially back before we had automatic starters and no, and people didn't lock their cars all the time, you'd go out and sit in your car and then say, gosh, oh, this isn't my car. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, obviously, they don't want something prosecuted for, for that. Uh, but uh, so so those are, that's a piece. I don't think I shared that town meeting, so I thought I'd share it now. Uh, so judiciary is working on a lot of the, and not judiciary, the uh, uh, the House is working on a lot of those kinds of trying to address all these various issues while, of course, we had to update the um, 
uh, Budget Adjustment Act, which happens in between every year, every uh, to see how much you've spent on this and how much you spent on that, and and if you've overspent in this, or it looks like you're going over and spending this this program, but you're underspending in that program, then shifting that money around, uh, and then of course also we have a couple weeks before we have to have the fiscal year 2025 budget uh, uh, done in the House, so it's sent over to the to the Senate, and uh, so there's a lot of a lot of budget meetings right now where committees come in and say, uh, not committees, uh, uh, state departments and and social service groups and all that stuff coming in and saying, um, we would like more money than the governor put in their budget. And, uh, and that was one of those things that I- you never see less of. <coughs> you know, there have been a few, there actually have been a few that have said, said, you know, we did our thing and we're done, uh, and we don't need the money, and 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 that's that's a that's a nice thing to have, um, and uh, but yeah, and and this was one of the one like it was the first political lesson I got when I joined when I was elected was because um, you know, very first thing you do you get in there and these people are coming in to talk to you about money, and uh, and it's an interesting game and I understand every governor plays it regardless of what what you know, party or wherever they are in, but, but the governor gives out a budget, but governor says, whatever you do, you sneaky legislature, don't you, don't you go over my budget. I have carefully crafted this thing exactly the way I want it. And then, you know, two hours later, somebody from their administration comes in and says, the governor has said they only want this for this program. This program is really good. It does a lot of really great stuff, and we haven't quite finished everything we need to do. The governor said we can only have this much, well, it would be nice if we had more, and and uh, and so often legislature will be like, well, you you just you know if you prove your case to us that you need that additional in order to actually finish the job, then we're going to say yes, and then and then of course that gets used against us later in the year because we went over the budget, uh, and uh, so you know it's it's, uh, it's politics, people talking on both sides of their mouths. I'm ready for questions. I don't want to go too long on this stuff. I just want to, um, at people uh, at town meeting, those of you who are there, I got talking about stuff my committee was doing. I'm trying not to talk about that because I get so excited and I never shut up. Um, uh, because there's a whole data privacy piece uh, around that. And I and I uh, 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 I just find the data privacy thing fascinating and scary, but the but our committee is really working on, on a bill to make Vermont Pretty much, uh, maybe second to California, have the gold standard of data privacy in the U.S. Um, and really kind of protection for, for folks. So, um, yeah, you, you brought up the question of policing, and obviously that's been on Bethel's agenda <coughs> and other nearby towns. <coughs> yeah, um, there is a concern among some, many actually, in town that doesn't really get articulated often very well, and that is having more police uniformed, carrying guns and all of the rest of it, isn't necessarily the, the only approach to dealing with uh, untoward behavior. And, um, and there are people in the community for whom uh, I remember when one of our constables was just coming on and we're talking about going to the schools and so on and so forth. They said, well, can you do that not wearing the uniform and not wearing having a gun strapped to your hip and, and all of the rest of it because there may be students who uh, find that more frightening than than helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've <laughs> the the select board has gone into that same. Well, let's just get more police and and more time and more boots on the ground and and somehow it'll all get better. Well, it's not necessarily going to all get better. It's just for combat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, let's face it. I mean. 
a, a lot, a large part of our criminal activity is drug related. Um, and so, at, and, and just to be clear, this isn't my committee, so I, my knowledge is fairly superficial about what they're doing. But, the, uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, uh, you know, the, the uh, Health and Human Service Committees, uh, there's two separate, you know, they're, they're working on, on, you know, programs and things to help with, with people who are, uh, you know, have drug issues. There's, they're, they, you know, and they're working with people with mental health issues and some, sometimes, sometimes they're medicating for mental health issues and, and so working on those kind of issues. I mean, yeah, as a whole, it's a, it, yeah, drugs are a problem, but they're also a symptom of a, of a, of a larger problem. And, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you have a large homeless population, it goes both ways. I mean, a lot of people who are homeless may have chemical problems, but also if you have, if, uh, but you know, if you're homeless, again, a lot of people will self-medicate or find other ways to, to address your issues. So, so there's a whole piece that's working on that. Um, uh, the Judiciary Committee themselves, uh, you know, work on, on law and, you know, regulations and those kind of things, um, and trying to encourage the, uh, the Department of Public Safety, the state police and the various policing organizations to, to uh, work on better programs for, for, for that kind of stuff. I mean, I remember back in the day, I think the, the Bethel Business Association sort of helped organize community policing around, uh, around. I remember there used to be signs around town, you know, saying this community is under community, wa you know, community watch. Well, we did that on North Main Street ourselves <coughs> because of all the heroin. Oh, was it? Was it you all yourself? But I remember there. Was, I mean, there had been, you know, uh, initiatives and around that stuff, and but I don't, I don't know specifically. But I, I do know that there are people uh, in the legislature that. But hear what you're saying. That just just having, um, you know, uh, uniformed officers doesn't necessarily deter all crime, and and it uh, and it can be. Uh, some people find it disturbing. Well, I don't know, Scott. Just, a, you just, can... just a note on that policing thing. Yeah. Um, we had a problem on North Main Street, and I called the police. I gave them all the license plates, numbers, all that sort of stuff. Nothing, nothing ever happened and was continued. And so I talked to the state police and I said, well, what about, you know, forming a, a community, community watch? Yeah. And, you know, maybe, the, you, you know, you could just have a trooper come in and talk to us about it or whatever. He said, no, we don't want, don't want you to do that. And I, and I said, why? And he said, because we know where, we know where the drug dealer is if you put that up, then they move, and then we got to find them again. And I thought, well, I don't care if he moves. Yeah. And so that's when I got the neighbors to, and we bought yeah. signs, and there's still some of them. They're still in my, my old house. It's still, it's yeah. still there, and that's, I don't know how many years, but it's got to be over 15 years. Yeah. And um, I don't think it's the cops' fault. The cops do their job. I think the cops. We take the wind completely out of the cop's sails. They do their job. They they take the kids to court, and then they're out on the street. They were too late, or kind of giving the cops the finger. They're just doing it on our street. It hasn't. He can go to jail for two weeks, three weeks. I think he's got an ankle bracelet right on now. He's still doing business. Yep. I mean, it's yeah. And, the and only that, people that deal dealt with the guy that's dealing on our street, quite frankly, is New Hampshire. Yeah, they put him in jail. And that, and that is again. I mean, that's part of what the, the judiciary trying to um, trying to get more judges, if nothing else, so they can actually get him into court. Because uh, I think we know who we're talking about. And uh, uh, and also, <coughs> um, you know, so, so getting him into court, and also again, sort of changing some of those laws to make it easier to actually actually aggregate, prosecute those kind of crimes. Um, and so I, I do know that, again, I'm not on the judiciary, but, but from talking with some members that are, uh, I do know that that is, I mean, it's a problem in a lot of towns, and, and, they're, and they're, they're trying to address that. And whatever happened to three strikes? 
we used to have a three strike thing. This, this gentleman they're talking about, he's up four, five, six, eight, nine strikes. He, he should, we should never see him again. Yeah, I, I agree. Never. <laughs> but I, I have maybe a weird question. So what would you do? As community members, you have a drug dealer in your neighborhood. What are you gonna do? Walk over and beat the shit up? I mean, what are you gonna do? I'm confused. Well, what well, does well, a neighborhood actually, watch do? This, 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 this. We have videotapes, we have logs of, of license numbers, with the cars that come, the cars that go, the time they go, and had a meeting right on my front porch with the constable, and, and it just lip service, to tell you the truth. And okay. I think they're really frustrated. I think the constable has done his job. And, and I think when the, once it gets into the, to the court system, I don't think our court system does its job. So it's it, really surveillance. This, this, this kid, I've lived next to him since he was born. And he's been to rehab a couple times. And I tried to help him after, you know, like the second rehab. And we were, I was talking about it. And basically, he got through rehab, but he couldn't, he could not schedule an appointment with a doctor to get Suboxone until two weeks after he was let out. Now, to my way of thinking, he should have had that prescription the day he left. Should have walked out with so it. So by the two weeks, by the time he's doing the Suboxone, he lives in Bethel, the Suboxone was in White River. So now somebody's got to get him to, to, to White River and um, that doesn't work, and of course they, they won't even, because Suboxone, they can sell that and buy more heroin. The Suboxone's yeah. worth more. Than, so bottom line is um, he has to go down there and he has to swallow the stuff in front of the person, and he's going to get back to Bethel. And so just, he's set up for failure from the jump. And yeah, it, it's, he's, it's he's the failure. Even, he's so, yeah. so him, and I think, you know. And then we're pissed off at him because he's, can't. And, and and it's it, it's there's there's a whole lot of holes that could be filled that are short of throwing them in jail. Yeah. But I think at some point that 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 you're going to have to build more jails if you aren't going to try to rehabilitate them because this bullshit. But we don't even have a place for juveniles to go in the state. I mean, it's, the whole thing is bullshit. Yeah. Um, the whole system is wrong, and. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, yeah, and uh, and so I, yeah, there the legislature is working on that. I know that the um, corrections and institutions committee. Uh, let's see, am I, is that correct? Buildings. Let me get all my committee. But I know that that anyway, the the uh, committees that that oversee such things as. I mean, corrections, they're working on trying to they update don't communicate. those things. They don't, the medical people don't communicate with the police. The whole, I mean, this thing, they, they found this person living in South Main Street. Yeah. And the paper said, well, we just got a tip. Now, this has been going on for 15, 20 years, and all you need to do is come to my house and ask me where he is, and I will tell you. Yeah. And I have told them. Until it nauseous. Oh, I know. I, know. I mean, so, it's is crazy. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, and this is a problem that that across the legislature, across state agencies, um, they don't communicate. Uh, you know, silos. That they, they that's what they call them silos, and they really are that. Um, I mean, I think you all you all heard me. At, those of you who are at town meeting heard me make the reference to the workforce silos where where every, you know, the Department of Labor, Department of Education, Department of Ag, Department, all, all of those have, have little trainings and, and scholarships and stuff to help people get jobs and improve all that stuff. And none of those communicate with each other. They aren't aware of each other. Uh, they, uh, sometimes they get no one to, to do anything with their programs because no one knows about their programs, no one's referring. So we're, we're trying to set up things to break out of those silos to help that. And, 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 and that's the case with this too, right? I mean, uh, each, each department becomes his little, their, their own little kingdoms and, and they really don't, you know, and they, and they, there's a, there's a part of it where, where they're just so busy they don't even think to talk to each other. But there's also a little piece of it where, 
they're afraid that if they talk to someone else, someone else might get in their business. And, uh, and so they... And that's the answer. It is, isn't it? Jeez, right? um, whoa, what a revelation. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's a... Ch- you know, as, as a legislature, and we're, we're trying really hard, and, and it comes up all the time about breaking out of silos. My committee works, tries to work, you know, we're, because my committee is commerce and economic development. So we're always working on, uh, we are working with the agency of education around uh, career tech education, because they've been handling that by themselves, won't, won't you know, don't want to talk to uh, you know, commerce and community development. So we're, we're like, but you know, you got to have that if you're going to have jobs. And of course, in education, doesn't want to talk to the Department of Labor about apprenticeships, right, for like plumbers and stuff. So we finally got them wrestled together so that they've created kind of this comprehensive thing that works together uh, that they're still sort of building. But that's that's one of our big struggles is getting getting these agencies to communicate. Now, want to rec- want to point out all of these agencies like every company in Vermont, is understaffed, can't find anybody to do the jobs. So they're also not working at, at full capacity, and that's a problem. Uh, and you know, in, my, in my committee, our chair finally has started to make, when we set up a program, whether, we, whether it's our, our idea or the administration's idea, we set up a program, we and usually, you ask for at least after the first year, and usually forever, you say, once a year, you gotta tell us how it went. Right? Give us a report. And we've, we've, we discovered that we, they couldn't be, one, they couldn't be verbal reports. Uh, well, if they couldn't be just they mail us the, you know, email us the report. Because lots of times, we just never would get a report. They wouldn't even bother to send it. So then, and then it was like, well, come give us a verbal report, and uh, and and it has to be. But we finally realized it has to be. They have to walk in, sit down in our committee, and tell us face to face, did you do what you said you were going to do, what we uh, authorized? And it is not uncommon that the answer is, no, we decide not to do it. And we're like, you know, we passed a law saying you're supposed to do it, and they're like, no. Eh. And so, so now some committees, some committees are starting to actually build into their bills saying, and if you don't do this thing, it's going to affect the funding of that thing because, because that's the stuff that they care. Um, and uh, so it, it's this interesting struggle that's going on between, you know, uh, and yeah. One of the things that seems to, seems to happen is the more money you spend, the more power, the more money you have access to, or the more power you have. So if, if my budget's bigger than yours, then I have more power than you, and, and therefore they hold on to the, their, their budget and they don't share with the other people for the common good. They, they, That's right. Cause they, it's all about, it's all about <coughs> controlling the dollars. Because yeah, if you get part of my budget, well then that, that yes. means what I can do. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, this is, some of this is the stuff I'm, I'm doing a class on at Bethlehem University on the insider's look at, at government. And, and this is the kind of stuff I want to talk about. Not, not necessarily, I'm not talking politics, I'm not going to talk about specific bills, but, but sort of these dysfunctions about how the system doesn't work, how people don't communicate with each other, games they play with each other. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think we finally killed the, Governor's program of giving people who moved to Vermont ten thousand dollars, but we've been trying. The legislature has been trying. The House has been trying to kill that for years because we think it's stupid. Um, do, and they, to- do the people that support that program <coughs> know that we grease the skids for kids to leave with our portability of these act dollars? Oh, five I, million dollars I, a year. Five million dollars a year we give as grants, not loans. Grants to kids to take the out-of-state colleges and seven out of ten of them don't return. That's right. And then we have to pay money for kids to come back to school. That's right. Does anybody know what the right hand's doing with the no, left hand? No, well, that's it, right? And, and I mean, and that, it, both those issues uh, have passed through my committee. They're not exactly my, our jurisdiction, but, but again, 
we, we, we touch on them. And so, so the, the, cause the governor, governor would argue that the $10,000 gets more people here to work. Did and your committee look at, at what Vermont does versus other states? Well, oh yeah. If you take the percentage of our dollars that we send out of state, we are off the spectrum. We're down here. The second state comes near the middle. We, oh, are, I know. we are so off the charts and yeah. we have, we have a disintegrating school system, yeah. oh, I and know. we spend five million dollars a year to grease the skids for kids to leave. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and and that's uh, and my committee interfaces again with that workforce development piece, which is the universities, colleges, and all the things. So VSAC comes and reports to us, and so we're aware of this, and uh, and and at least in my committee, we recommended that we stop that. But you know, uh, but too many legislators, quite frankly, from my perspective, <coughs> take advantage of this, and they support this program so they can send their kids out of state to other colleges on the taxpayers' tab, and they let this Vermont State College system, where basically the poor kids go, rot. And more than likely, those kids are not even native, and the legis those people that are right. making those laws are not right. even native to but Vermont. But it's okay. But yeah. For the last so, six, we finally had to close the dorms at DTC. For the last five years I was there, when the kids took a shower, the water came up the, the drain mm. and filled the bottom of the shower with gray water. Yeah. And that's how they started their day. I, I had one morning class, 9 o'clock on Friday morning before Labor Day weekend. All the, and I'm, in a, I'm in a lecture hall. All the kids would talk about how disgusting the bathrooms were. And then we were also spending $750,000 on TV ads that nobody ever saw. That it, yeah, sorry. It, the, the legislature destroyed the state college system. We went nine years, nine years without an educator in the chancellor's office. It was one political hack after another. I'm sorry. Yeah, that and was they before drove, my time. So. And they drove it into the ground. Yeah, so. yeah. That was before my time. We're we're trying to do what we have where we are now. But the damage is done. Yeah. While we're on that decision, um, one of the things that drives me crazy when I was a kid during summer. Barnard Lake hired a bunch of kids to to um, lifeguard, do you know, work yeah. up there. Now we spend millions of dollars in Philadelphia, and New York, and whatever to get people to come up here, but they 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 can't leave their kids at Barnard Lake because there's there's not a lifeguard. We can't yeah. afford a lifeguard, but we can spend. My theory is, you get them here, you want them to have a good time. They say, well, geez, I can't go home back and cook supper without bringing the kids back or, you know. Yeah. And you come up here and you, and, and it drives me also insane. You get up here and there's not a place to go to the bathroom on the interstate. I mean, yeah. Yeah. give me a break. Yeah. It's, I won't, because going, of course, Massachusetts is narrow. Yeah. But I refuse to stop in Massachusetts, so they don't have a rest area anywhere on 91. Just uh, whatever. It's yeah. just, it's. There's it's a couple so, on 95 that I would not get within 100 yards of. <laughs> you can't stand it. Well, but the point is, at least it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you get to be my, my age, it's very important. <laughs> so, <laughs> we do this, every 15 miles. <laughs> this, this, this young lady came in saying she had some questions she wanted. Well, to I want to. And I want to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, a couple things. Um, oh, sorry, no, sorry. Um, so, I did not reach out to you. I did reach out to a couple representatives that um, didn't take it serious, I guess. They didn't. Whatever. Um, but I did not reach out to you, and I will also say that ignorance is bliss, and this is probably not as um, detrimental as heroin addicts and school budgets and whatever, but it's important to me, so, yep. um, I, uh, it's about massage therapy in the state of Vermont and the lack of education that someone needs in the state of Vermont to have a massage therapy license. I am a massage therapist. Um, it's insulting to my profession. Um, from, and from what I understand, not sure, because I've been gone and back and whatever, um, that it, the reason why the law is the way that it is is to do to sex workers. And if that's, and I'm not 100% sure if that's the case or not, but from my research, that's what I found, which is even more insulting to my profession, right? Because we're, you know, healers. 
I can tell you that um, Vermont is the only state in the nation that requires nothing. So you can go pay your $50 or $70 and go get a massage therapy license and open a business right there and need no education. I have a problem with that because somebody could seriously get hurt. We probably have. And I can tell you that in the 49 states, and it, and it stuck out to me because I'm from here, right? When I, took my, when I went to school, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, nobody hears about Vermont, Vermont, what state's that in? What speak language do you speak? So I automatically, Vermont? No education. So this is how it's broken down in the other 49 states. In the state of New York, you need a thousand <coughs> clock hours. So in New York, in education, right? So some you need semester <coughs> hours, some you need clock hours, and the clock hour is you may need 500 clock hours, and they literally every hour is accounted for, opposed to a semester, right? So in in the state of Alaska, you need a thousand. No, I just lied. In the state of New York, you need a thousand hours, and in the state of Hawaii, you need a thousand hours. Okay, clock hours. In the state of New York, it falls under medical, right? It falls under you have to go under a medical board to get a <coughs> massage therapy license. In Hawaii, it's a thousand hours. They have their own. They have their own massage technique. It's called Lomi Lomi, right? And they have a thousand hours. All right, so those are the two states with a thousand hours. There's several that have 750, 600 hours, 500 hours, whatever. <coughs> so in the state of Hawaii and the state of New York, you have to take their test at their facility. It's a special test just for massage therapy, right? In the other 47 states, it's called the Mblex. okay? So I can take one test in a uh, facility, you know, where you go and make appointments to take any, on any day, and I have to show my credentials of, you know, my school and whatever, and then I can take the Mblex, and then I can go to any state showing my school, showing my MBLEX, whatever. Um, so in any state, you need at least 500 hours. And then in most states, which, you know, pick your battles, it falls under body work, falls under uh, uh, spa, haircuts, barbers, and cosmetology. things like cosmetology, which is, you know, also insulting. Uh, also insulting, <laughs> yeah. But it be, but it's different because in New York, I mean, like when we went to when I was in school in New York, it was no joke. You know, um, we did we did my uh, myology, pathology. I mean, we did all of it. So, not all schools are like that. Not all states are like that. But Vermont needs to change, and we need to be more. We need to be better, <laughs> and. And if it is true that it's, you know, it's because of the sex workers, I, I don't know. I, I read something about, I, I did go online and look at something about the a lady at the Office of Professionals and because the, you didn't need a license at all. You could just do it, yeah. right? So that's how it came about. Then it finally you needed at least a license yeah. and it had to do with the sex workers and not stopping that, you know, how is the massage license going to... And then here's another fun fact, teach all of you something. The difference between a masseuse, a masseuse is a sex worker, a licensed massage therapist is a massage therapist. You'll find a licensed massage therapist at an <coughs> office. You'll find a masseuse at a parlor. Okay? So, so that is my... And yep. ignorance is bliss. As, as a licensed acupuncturist who's, uh, who also does twin up, who, had, who watched 
my profession have to go through all those same stages, actually, in, in Vermont. Uh, when I first became a licensed acupuncturist, well, I first became what was called a registered acupuncturist, which was exactly the status that massage therapists currently have, which is you had to fill out, you had to, you did have to say, I went to school somewhere, and, and, and you, and then, and then you just said, I went to school somewhere, and then, and you paid them 50 bucks, and you got a license, yeah. right? And so, you know, I used to joke, anybody could, you know, go buy some knitting needles and, you know, uh, open practice. Um, and so, so, I, so there's two pieces here I want, I want to emphasize. And, and I, I do want to say, I, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's a profession that needs to be taken, considered a profession and treated as such. Uh, it, because it shouldn't be treated less important than cosmetology. And, and, so, and somebody could really hurt somebody. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, yeah. just, you just lodge a yeah. quad and, you know, yeah. and it's like, oh, well, yeah. one saw Sally yeah. and she rubbed me and yeah. now I'm dead. Yeah. Uh, so, so a couple things. Uh, uh, one is that um, the this whole, even the registration of a massage therapist, I was just barely, uh, do was I, was it, did it happen in 2020? It may have, uh, or it was just before that. And, and so I was talking with a number of other massage therapists at that time when they were trying to set up something. That, because they, that, I believe they initially came in, the initial bill was actually for licensure. And, and part of the problem, I think, is that they tried to lump all body workers into it, and and that, and in particular, they tried to lump in Reiki practitioners, and uh, and the and they wanted and the Reiki folks were lobbying to be part of it, uh, and so ultimately it became, you know, but but what kind of training do they get, right? Right. I, yeah, I have it. And so so so, uh, so it ultimately sort of watered down the whole bill. Uh, more, more so than just kind of worrying about sex workers. That's just people being ignorant about the profession. Uh, but, uh, but so that, so that was kind of the compromise they came up with. But I'm also I want to say that when acupuncture started this process, we got all that same like you know, our, is this voodoo? Uh, you know, and and the process it went through was was first they registered us, then a few years later they did. Uh, they created a second level, which was certification, which had to, at that point, you had to show that you, you it was more than just paying your 50 bucks. It was, you know, you had to show that you'd received training. And, 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 then, uh, and then after that, a few years, they then ultimately turned it into licensure. And I, I think that that is sort of, the model that the Office of Professional Regulation likes to use. They, 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 I think they're worried that if they jump too quickly, and, and it was frustrating as heck for acupuncturists, because, yeah, so, I, so I completely understand what you're saying. And, uh, uh, but that's sort of the, it, took, it was a process to get there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of disturbing that it's 2024, 1974, yeah. 1984. <clears throat> Maybe even 1994, but it's 2024, yeah. and we have 49 other states I know. I know. that aren't that yeah. you know. So yeah, I I, mean, I I I just I have to say as a as someone whose license covers Chinese herbs, Vermont also does not regulate herbalists in any way. Yeah. And so okay, so who, all right. So, so what do we need to do to change this? Who do I need to talk to to change this? Either well, the I mean, the, community, the medical people. Who do uh, we need to I talk mean, to yeah, it, it probably needs needs to have another another bill written to to update. So talk to me, uh, and uh, um, and yeah, uh, assuming I get reelected, I'm happy to happy to do this. Uh, but yeah, uh, because even if we start with something simple, hey, you need an education. Yeah, and take the MLEX. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not but, not difficult. Yeah, but th but that's the that's the place it would be because what you do is you create a bill, and then and then assuming that so then this first first get somebody to write you a bill, then that bill is going to go to the health uh, committee. Then you have to lobby the health committee to have them actually bother to. To, to work on that bill. Right. Once they work on that bill, 
And that's where most bills go to die. That, they, go, they die there. Uh, and sometimes it's not because they're bad bills. Sometimes it's because there are other bills that are more important. They have a finite amount of time to get them in. Uh, and, and so the, and then they, the next step after that is then, <laughs> then you would get the Office of Professional Regulation. All those people would start coming in. All the, and, and, then, and that's really when you, know, you get all your massage therapist friends to show up and testify and, and, and state this on the record. Yeah. And, and so, that's how you make those changes. And I guess that's, that's what I struggle with when it's like, why would we have to have, when it's common sense, right? I mean, this is common sense. Why do I need to call a hundred, you know, the massage therapists in the state of Vermont to go and say, hey, this is common sense. Somebody could really hurt somebody. So I, I guess I struggle with that piece of it. If why we have they to waste 50, all the money. They need 50 waste, people to tell them. They have to, yeah. yeah do it, right? I mean, yeah. because that's just silly. It, that's silly. The that's, whole process that's, is silly. That's, I it mean, is. It it's is. like, I mean, I, I, you know, okay, so you say, you say, so it's more valid the more people say it? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's exactly yeah. how it works. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a. <laughs> either, I, both ways. If you get enough people to say you don't need it, right? Yeah. Well, forget it. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the, and I honestly, I, I think it's a feature, not a bug, uh, which is which is unlike a lot of other states. Uh, Vermont purposely has a very deliberative legislative process. Um, but it's so, exhausting and nothing gets done. Well, it, it's true. It, 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 does, <laughs> it does. It does. It does. And, and, and again, sometimes that's a good idea because there are a lot of people that come into this room and say, why did the legislature do this thing? Didn't they listen to anybody, right? And so, so if the other side of that is, is sometimes legislators put in a stupid bill and, uh, and, and you want people to have the opportunity to say, that's a stupid bill uh, and, uh, and, and, and to, to kill it. So, so the, the legislative process is very deliberative. We spend hours on, on, and we talk to everyone who's pro or con, and we and, and, and do all that stuff. So it's in, it's intentional. Right, and I and I get that for things that aren't. Um, I get that if, if it was a debatable, if it was a debatable uh, the, the topic. Pro the problem is <laughs> there are people that will really debate. <laughs> that. It's all yeah, debate. You're interfering with my right to make a living. Yeah. No, no, I well, mean, that's, but that's it's not debatable that somebody could get hurt. So, you know, the health and safety part of that, the health and safety part, I don't see how the health and safety part, the safety part, uh, is that's debatable. That's why you have to testify. Well, just just wait till there's a bill, and yeah. you'll see yeah. how debatable It'll go to die. So, <laughs> well, I mean, the whole thing is, is there's going to be, uh, when that bill comes, you know, there are hundreds of, of people who have no credentials whatsoever. But they've been doing it for a long time, and and they're, and they're, and if good or bad, but nonetheless, it's a it's a true statement, and so so those people are going to come out, and because you're putting them out of their business, and so they're all going to come, and they're going to want to say what's the issue, and so this is why they start the process of registration, because the idea is if they register, then you can add some new criterion that they can step up slowly to, to qualify for, and, and so you can ease them up to being trained, and if they aren't willing to train, then, but, but, so, it, but, you, but if you just say one day, all you back rubbers are out of business, right, right. they're, they're going to... Okay, but I, because I, I've been here when it's happened, yeah. and I've seen it in other places, that people are grandfathered in, right? When, like, when my sister was 18 and the whatever went to 21, she was grandfathered in. So though the law was 21, she was 18, she could, so do they not grandfather laws anymore? Or uh, is that not a thing? Or, can. Right, okay, yeah. so there's that pop Yeah. There's, solved. The, there's another place where bills die, uh, and that's called the wall. Um, and you and I have had a conversation about uh, a ratepayer protection plan for electric yeah. utilities. And uh, right now, that's may not even be taken up by a committee uh, because the committee is out of time, but or or whatever whatever the reason. Uh, and we're at the end of a biennium 
which means that if nothing happens to it, everything stops and starts back again yeah. next year at, at zero. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and in this particular case, something that would protect the, the lowest income Vermonters and their utility bills, yeah. uh, has the risk of just not being taken up because it's been crowded out by other yeah. other stuff that yeah. it's taken time. Yeah, and I and I think there, I, I feel that at some point those things that crowd out are somebody's baby. They may not necessarily serve a large portion, but they serve my constituents in Burlington. So I'm going to push out this thing that covers 90% of the folks, or say 70% of the folks in Vermont, because my 100 constituents in Burlington really need this. And I mean, I've seen that, so I know that happens. Yep. And that's where someone's going to step up and say, no, Mr. Senator from Chippewa County, I know you've got a whole bunch of people, but no. Not going to happen. Yeah. But, but that's what needs to happen. But it's not going to happen. I mean, yeah. I, in a way, the most powerful people in the legislature are the committee chairs. Uh, those are the people who, who decide what gets worked on, what doesn't get worked on. Um, and, and they, so yeah, so they're, they're the people that make that call. And, and they are, if they're doing their job, they're representing their constituents, right? I mean, I don't, but while I am in the House and I make, you know, we work on bills to affect all Vermonters, honestly, I don't care a whole lot about other places than these four towns, right? And if a bill isn't going to, right, if a bill is going to be good for the rest of the state, but it's going to be bad for Bethel or Rochester or Stockbridge or Hancock, I'm going to vote against it uh, because because my constituents are here. And, and they're all going to do that. So the senator from Chittenden County is going to do that for this. And, and they do. And they do. That's and what they're elected for. That's, what you're, that's your job. And, but but it, is, it is sometimes a problem. And you do, uh, I've said this before, uh, you know, some people will be like, well, you know, what's the, what's the politics like up, you know, in Montpelier, is it, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats banging heads? I'm like, most of the time, Republicans, Democrats, progressives are working just fine together. They cooperate quite a lot. The, uh, the, the battle is usually Chittenden County versus the rest of the state. Uh, and uh, you know, they have a lot of representation because they have a lot of population. Uh, and so, so you try to get, I know in my committee, for example, where economic development and the state is always coming in saying, "Is we got a new program about this thing we'd like to put in Burlington?" <laughs> yeah, and, and we're always saying, "Yeah, well, what about Linden? <laughs> you know, now what what about you now Townsend? You know, uh, uh, you know, what can we do for those towns? Because because Tittany County's doing okay, uh, and uh, and and it, it's it, it so also I would." Argue that the administration, the, the the state agencies, also sort of, I mean, they see Chen County as our, as the economic driver for the state, and 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 they're always thinking about what they can do to make that better, and the rest of us have to keep pushing back on that. That is so so blinder it, because you know, okay, let's keep fixing this and that, and the the rest of the state isn't, where if you could fix the whole state, yeah. Oh. That 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 would that would fix Burlington too. Uh, I know. I uh, agree with you. No, we gotta fix we gotta fix this one little spot, and that'll be the that'll be our yeah our uh, holy yeah. grail. And uh, can I bring up another topic? Yes, absolutely. I want to talk about what what prompted me to speak. I spoke at the uh, education meeting of town meeting, and what prompted me to speak, quite frankly, was an article in the Valley News uh, by the former. Um, President of the Vermont School Boards Association. I don't know if you read it or not. His name is. No, I, I know Neil, about what Neil Dell. Um, and 
what really prompted me to to step up and speak, he kind of wrote a, a letter to the future of Vermont. And, and, and bear with me, his first sentence I think is rather profound. So it says, Dear Future Vermont, I'm sorry. I apologize for where you are now. It was our fault. Things got strange around 2022 to 2024 and went sideways. Maybe if more of us had been vocal, things could have turned out differently. It was that sentence that made me stand up and speak, all right? Maybe if more of us were, were more vocal, things could have turned out differently. And um, so I spoke at town meeting. Um, Dave called me up the, the next day and asked me to come here. Uh, the Valley News has called me up and asked me to write an op-ed piece, which I think will be in, in this Saturday. Um, but when you take a look at what this guy has stated about the current state of education in Vermont, it is nothing short of alarming and it's unconstitutional. So bear with me for, for one more paragraph from this guy because he says it better than I ever could. And he said, early spring of 2024, right here, was a challenging time in Vermont. In those years, while we still had a public education system, it was being stretched to its limit and was beginning to unravel. The refunding pressure statewide, the dual system of accountability for public and private and religious schools, a dysfunctional agency of education, the state board of education friendly to private schools, and a legislature that struggled with the unintended consequences of a poorly designed education funding bill. Basically, he said to quote Charles Dickens, it was the worst of times. That's, that's where we find ourselves in, in, in our education system. So if you bear with me, I, I actually spent some time um, to dig into the, to the history of, of our school voucher program. And please correct me if I, if I go straight here. You may know, may know more than I do. And the first tack of, of where people have a problem with our, our school voucher program, we're, we're sending vouchers to private schools, is the, the common benefits clause of the Vermont Constitution. This is one of our guiding lights in Vermont. And this is what our common benefits clause says. It says that government is, or ought to be, instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community, and not for the particular, particular emolument or advantage of any single person, family, or set of persons. Public education and public education are common benefits, all right? What we have done in our system here, if we look at 1991, Prior to that, our public school voucher system was consistent with our, our common benefits clause of our Constitution. Because prior to 1991, uh, tuition students could enroll in public schools in neighboring districts or in one of Vermont's academies. And that was Linden Institute, St. Johnsbury Academy, Burr Burton, and Thetford Academy, which I think were all in existence for over 100 years. They're, they're and they made the point in, in the enabling legislation that these academies conform to most standards and rules for public schools, right? 1991, things changed, and vouchers could be paid, pre, be paid to private independent schools. And now payment of vouchers go to religious schools and shows us how far our vouchers have moved away from our core Vermont values. We've abandoned our constitutional commitment to common benefits, and we've turned school budgets into a source of funds for private interests. We're even sending public school dollars to elite prep schools in other states. My position is public Europe, money should be for pub, huh? And Europe. Yeah, yeah, just one in Switzerland, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pro public money should be for public education, not private benefit. Anytime we send a voucher to a school that does not serve a public purpose, makes everyone pay more so that a handful of people can have taxpayer funded benefits. So I think we've got to come around and refocus on our common benefit clause here, all right? It's been 33 years since we've been doing this. I have no hope in that happening, to tell you the truth, all right? Um, another reason why we should revise our, our voucher program is demonstrated by the fact that we facilitated development of a private school system that has negligible regulation, minimal oversight, and complete independence from duly elected school boards. Their characteristics of school boards vary directly with public schools. Private schools can pick and choose who they accept, effectively taking public dollars, but refusing to educate the public's children. In private schools, faculty do not need to be certified in their field or be licensed by the state to teach. 
Private schools are not required to public, publish assessment results or other account, accountability factors. Employees of private schools are not protected by collective bargaining agreements and often have weak benefits. The citizens who pay the bill for these students do not have to get to vote on the school's budget, and the unelected boards of directors of private schools have no obligation to the public who provides most of their revenue. All right, so we have a complete dichotomy going down here. This is the anomaly to me, is our State Board of Education. They have a responsibility for establishing rules for our education system, but they resisted any attempt to make standards for private and public schools the same. We have different rules for public schools and different rules for private schools. And, and, and I personally have, have a problem with that because it violates at least our common benefits clause of our Constitution. I, I had no hope of that changing until 2022 decision from the U.S. Supreme Court. This is the show changer right here. So A, I think on its merits, we should not be sending public money to private schools. Now, constitutionally, we even have a bigger issue, all right? And this came in 2022, it was a case out of Maine, and the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision in a case called Carson versus Macon. And it presents Vermont with significant challenge, but also a unique opportunity. So what the Supreme Court said, that a state need not pay funds to private schools, but once it sends money to a private school, it has to send money to religious schools. Enter the Vermont Constitution now. We have Vermont Constitution, I think it's called the Compelled Support Clause of our Constitution. And basically it sets up the separation of church and state. It's been like this since 1777. Basically, people are free to worship what they want, free to government interference, and people in the state cannot be compelled to support religious institutions. So here's the problem. Here's the, the problem that's been faced for us by the Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court says you can give money to public schools, but if you do, you must give money to, pro to, to religious schools. The state constitution comes in and says we cannot give money to religious schools based on our constitution. There's only one clear path through this. We have to stop giving money to private schools. And the reasons for doing that are compelling. Everybody in your district, of the four towns you talk about, if we were to close private schools, their taxes would go down. Their prop school property taxes would go down. More money would come into our public school system. We could have more students in our system. Our average cost per student would come down, and our tax rates would come down. So why are we just overtly refusing to follow the Constitution? I'm curious what Scott thinks about this. No, I'm asking you. No, no. Well, I'm, no, because, because right. Scott why, is why a supporter is state, of why private the, schools. Why is the state, oh, I'm not, I don't talk about shared academy specific, why is the state ignoring the constitutional mandates? Because at this point, uh, I mean, I agree with you. I don't, I, I don't think you should be supporting private schools of any sort. Um, and, uh, and so I agree with you, and I'm actually, uh, Rebecca Holcomb, do you know oh, Representative really Rebecca? Rebecca. Um, so, so actually, but she she's and not I her position anymore. She's not. No, she's a legislator now. And uh, and so uh, Rebecca and I have actually been talking about this summer, trying to trying to uh, convene, even if it's not an official committee, you know, but get some legislators together and, and perhaps some others to try and figure out how we can how we can get through this roadblock because you're right the short answer is discontinue you know uh, those four traditional private schools uh, have actually all agreed that they do follow the state curriculum they have adopted the state curriculum so so st john's Bay academy that Perth academy for burton and linden, linden. Uh, and so so you know you could keep the four traditional academies and 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 still and, and then and then just and then only support public schools like we did before. Where we got in the problem was was we started the voucher program to these other private schools, and so. But now, if we're doing those private schools, then what we actually have is we have a constitutional uh, uh, prohibition. Uh, well, we we have a, Yeah. Well, what we have is we have the state constitution that says you can't. Our tax monies can't go to support. Uh, a kind of public institution, religious and, institution, and, and uh, yeah, religious institution, and the feds say that we have to, and so we have been. There have been people who've been trying to get this to change. This has been a. This has actually been a conversation in the legislature for for a couple of years, and 
and it was actually a big issue during the Budget Adjustment Act that we just passed. There were a number of legislators uh, objected to, to passing that budget because it was sending money to, it was, su it was supporting after school programs, but after school programs now also fall under the same thing. So, so if a church group wants to start an after school program, if we give money to any after school programs, whether it's done by the public school or anyone, we also have to give money to those, those church run after school programs. And so a number of legislators objected to that. It was, it was all prearranged. It was, it was a symbolic objection because the budget had to pass. But the idea is, is that we know that we need to come back and we need to find a way to take, to, to take this out and, and straighten it out. Um, but the, but the, the lobby for those private schools is pretty strong. And that doesn't trump the Constitution, sir. It, you're right, but um, all I'm saying is, is, and I agree with you, and I think we should we should correct this. I'm saying there are legislators who 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 are going to argue the other side of that, and so and are they going to change the Constitution? What's the point here? How can they argue that what we're doing is an overt violation of our state's constitution? I, I agree. I agree. And isn't the time ripe right now when we have 29 budgets that went down? Yeah, no. We, the time is right, right to strike now and push this through. Push these legislators to think differently. I agree. I agree, and I, and actually, I hope that that is is one of the one of the side effects of this whole budget piece is that it, that it brings that awareness to people of of all those points you made. I I, I agree with you. I, I I'm saying that that I. I'm one legislator amongst a number that are trying to make this. 149. Huh? There's 149. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I'm. I, uh, but we are. We are trying to. There are those of us that are trying to find, find, you know, a way to convince them or provide this information. But, uh, you know. Uh, so do they just overtly say, "I don't care what the Constitution says. We're sending money to this religious school." I think. I think what they. I think they they don't make that argument. The argument they make, the argument they make is this, and it's not completely without merit, uh, which is that there are some students for whom the public school system doesn't work well. There's a there's a carve out in the pending legislation for therapeutic schools. Yep, that's fine. But that, but that argument goes over there on the side. But 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 they they don't they don't put it over at the side, and so that's the well it is in the legislation. It's called therapeutic schools. Yeah, but but and that and this is one of those things that we're what they're trying to work around. So so I mean I think I know a lot of people who argue that Sharon Academy worked really well for their kids, uh, where the public schools didn't. And so so th And that's fine. But they should pay tuition to Sharon Academy. That that's how that works. I mean when Scott sent his son to Sharon Academy, you paid tuition for him to go and yep. it worked out well. Sharon Academy filled the need in this area when we had a bulge of population. Yeah. They did. But we don't have that bulge of population I mean, anymore. We've had, within our, our school district, our 10-town school district, four high schools have closed. We're down to one. Yeah. Will, in, will independent private schools have to close due to lack of enrollment? Absolutely. This is not a reason to keep spending, sending public money to those schools to prop them up. I, I agree. Legislators that live in those towns that those schools exist in, however, disagree. Well, and I'm not sure if that's true because of the 10 towns that, that, that in that school district, every one of those towns' property taxes would go down. Every one of your constituents' property taxes would go down I agree. if we only kept send, spending money to public schools. And I think you'll find that that, that, that might turn into a persuasive argument. I'm just saying, and, and it's persuasive to me. I mean, you're arguing with me, and I agree with you. I'm just saying that not everyone agrees with you. <laughs> and, so and, not everybody agrees with following the Constitution. Right. That's what you're coming down to. I, yeah. Yes, I, I think I, I think I am. I think they, they interpret it as not a conflict with the with the Constitution. I, I agree with you. I think it is a conflict with the Constitution. I'm just saying not everyone sees it that well, way. Well, then I come back to Mr. O'Dell's point. Perhaps it's because more of us should have spoke up. 
Yeah. And I think we need to now. Yeah, and I think the iron is hot right now to speak yeah. up. I, th I, th I, I think you're right. Call WPTC. Well, yeah. I, I got a, an op-ed piece yeah. known in the Valley yeah. News when I, it sent it to VT I, Digger. I think that's. I think it's fantastic, and I, I hope people take your lead. And I think I think you're absolutely right. I do think that that this is an issue that needs to be resolved, and and right now they're they're amongst. I, a, enough of my colleagues and enough of the members of the Agency of Education. Uh, the, the Agency of Education is notoriously recalcitrant to any kind of change. Uh, now they, 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 they resist even when the legislators say you're supposed to do this. And, and, and so I think a public Pressure campaign is is absolutely. Well, the government let the agency of education be without the leadership for almost a year. And talk to your governor. The <laughs> Department of Education. I, I don't know how this all works. Quite frankly, you can help me out. I'm assuming they're all politically appointed. Yes. At the Department of Education. No, and that, 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 that's why they at the top. They of just those. have blinders on that they're they're going to just support private schools. But they in in terms of the public good, educating the public, uh, which is what our public schools are supposed to be doing, critical thinking, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, uh, non-doctrinal, if that's um, the, the, not just public school or private schools, and not just religious schools, but homeschooling mm -hmm. is opens up a huge, my values are different from those of the community, so therefore my kids are going to be taught the way I want them to be taught, not the way that is good for the community. I mean, so uh, how how do we build some sort of accountability for for homeschoolers or for home and and uh, they're not paying tuition to anybody they are paying the taxes but it's a societal in, in my view if the society suffers when we don't have a common understanding, a of how 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 it works, you know, yeah. I I think you need to understand that there are large national forces that are dumping thousands and thousands of dollars into. You know, Vermont is one of those states that they want to flip into being a lot more like Alabama. And, uh, um, and so they are, they are dumping, the lobbyists are there, the money is there, the lawsuits are being written uh, for, for all those, right? I, I, and again, I agree with you with the social benefit of, of teaching discernment and, and, and those kind of things, but, but you can see that that's going into first Amendment right arguments right there, and that's that's going to go to that's if you start regulating what people are teaching their kids at, at home, right? That's that's going to be a court case. Um, I and, and regulating so, what what I teach it, what I teach my kids. Yeah. Uh, what I'm arguing is participation in the public education as well. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I don't have a problem with homeschools because they're not taking they're not taking money to do it. Yeah. No. They're, they're not taking public money for their private, for their private, they're doing it themselves. I don't have, my, my specific problem is I, public money going to private schools. You're getting off the track here. Yeah. Because that's well, what we have to focus on. Public money should not go to and private schools. I think that's, I, and Gene, while I hear what you're saying, I think that's the issue here is we start a conversation and then it goes yep. like this. No. Yep. No. We need I, to stay on this conversation. I agree. And work on it. And I will tell you uh, right now that. Uh, we've only got one more meeting such as this. Uh, hopefully uh, the senators will show up. 
Uh, maybe Becca White. She's never made one yet, but maybe she can even make one. I, I had a conversation with Bennett Law. I asked him to apprise the, the, the folks that this is going to come up. Yeah. And please be here and pay attention. And I even went so far as, please limit your, your talking to five to ten minutes because this is very important to the state, very important to Bethel. Yeah. And I have someone who he and I have not always agreed on a lot of things. <laughs> but this particular time, we are on the same page. I think most people yeah, will yeah. be, quite frankly. I, 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 I agree with you. I think, I think yeah. the yeah. average yeah. Vermonter oh, yeah. is going to say, yeah. oh, I didn't know. Uh, 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 which is why I think a, a public, a public information piece is, 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 is exactly good. And I think I, I, Dave's I, I, right that this is the right time. I'm retired. Yeah. Trying. And I'm willing to find a way, if there is a way, you guys leave Montpelier, there's people still up there yeah. talking. And if we need to go to meetings and rally people and stuff, I'm willing to be part of that. This needs to not get dropped. I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, and, and saying that, I wish this conversation had happened in January um, because we, because, I, because. I we're almost out of time with this list. Well, it's it's is there a funny formula unravel? We watched yeah. a lot of things. Get is there a way to make sure that it happens as soon as the session starts? Next yes. Year? Yes. Is, yes. So that oh. so that's the piece, right? So if if you can if you get this out, if Dave starts working on you know if 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 we can if you if if collectively this can be rallied, you know, so that there are those people. And like you said, I'm, I'm playing, I'm meeting with Re Rebecca and I, we had this conversation last week. Um, we, well, well, she's whenever. totally into the common benefits argument. She is, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, and, uh, and so, so and, and, we were, and we were talking about how, you know, the silos and all that stuff influence all this because again right the agency of education doesn't talk to anybody else so, so they're in their own little and that's back. true in the local community as well yeah the school board doesn't talk to the select board yeah and and you know so we go down these parallel tracks never talking about one another and yet you influence and, each other and for yeah. this climate activist that's a problem yeah yeah so, well, so I, think, I think in Bethel, though, to, to, I have to rebuild that a little bit. Is we have we have a, a very uh, unique situation in that we have a school board member on our select board, yeah. and he does keep we us. We did. Up. We still do. Chris Chris Jarvis is still on the select board. Yes, he's still on the select board. He's on the he's school board. He, he's still he's still on the school board. No, no, he came off. He just came off. Julian, oh, I didn't now. see that. So, any, but anyway, that's a, a I voted. that the the, <laughs> the silos. I didn't see his name on the ballot. The silos are what? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, as I said, I think uh, I think that there is going to be there is going to be meetings and people working on trying to come up with solutions over the summer, uh, so that so that. A bill can be ready, you know, because we can work with legislative council, you know, so it's got all the right legalese uh, now, and try and have something that can can hit the legislature the first week of January when we open, uh, and and try and get that going. And as as you all have have mentioned, right? I mean, I think the timing is is good because all these towns are like, why am I supporting private schools in Switzerland? Um, you know. Uh, in, in my own committee, when we 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 don't do the you know the primary education as much, we, you know where where we're doing we're doing college level you know training stuff like that. But but we've been trying to uh, we've been trying to there there are those forces that also say but you know we should be sending if if BSAC should be paying for kids to go to wherever Vermont schools with grants. I don't care about their loans. Grants yeah. to out of state schools. I, but their grants it should you, make them stay here, right? I can give you multiple examples. One of them was right here in this town, Samantha Woods. This has gone on for years. She was brilliant. She's a physician now. She got into Duke. And her mom went down. Her mom knew the, knew where dollars went. She's one of the best school board members we ever had. And they went down to Duke and I said, Well what happened at the financial aid when it went to the financial aid office? She said, Oh she said, they saw we were from Vermont. 
and they saw that, that Samantha had VSAC dollars. The VSAC dollars came in and they, they went in in lieu of Duke's endowment dollars. The parents' contribution didn't change five cents. Yep. We had taxpayer grants from Vermont go to Duke to support their, their, their endowment. Disgusting. This yep. happens, oh, yeah. this happens I know. repeatedly. I know. And, and we're like this about it. Yeah. And, and please, uh, look at the percentages. Yeah. Roland Hurl yeah, wrote yeah, an article on this. Our percentage of dollars that go out of state is just shocking. The second closest state to us is, is up near the middle. It's, it's bizarre what we do. And yeah. quite frankly, I think it's self-serving interests of people in the legislature that have or want to send their kids out of state to private schools. I think so. And can I tell you something? Because I've done a little research on all the representatives of Vermont and less than 15, and I'm going to say less than 15% of our 150 representatives are native. When, where do they send their kids to school? Right. I, so, at that so, point, I, I need... I, I'm, just I'm saying. sorry. I live in Vermont. <clears throat> I did was not born here. My grandparents are not in the cemetery in Bethel. But I am a Vermonter. I am too. Yeah. And, and I... There is... I'm just going to call this... Mm -hmm. uh, what it myopia... Is? about only helping people who are, quote, native, and only natives. No, 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 no. That's and, uh, But that's what you that's said. What you said. And I'm reacting because yeah. I am not native, but I still live here. No, but... And my grandchild needs or is entitled to go to the college or university of his or her choice whether it is in the state of Vermont or not, it's the, you know, to draw a line around yeah. this state as if nobody exists outside is wrong. No, 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 Vermonters yeah. who are entitled to some of the same benefits that Vermonters get when they stay in the town and in, in the state. That's all I'm saying. And, and I and totally I, agree. I, I am I'm, not our Yeah, so. I'm not dismissing your time in the state. All I'm saying, and I'm not I'm not dismissing that at all. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that, you know, a, a lot of our representatives are no longer native. That doesn't and, matter. And, so oh, what? you don't think it, so it, it matter doesn't matter? It does okay. not matter. They live here. They're representing right. the people where no, they live. No, it does okay. not matter. I'm sorry. No, no, and that's and that's. I went okay. to high school in Newark, New Jersey. I didn't feel uncomfortable on the Bethel School Board. <laughs> no, no, I, I guess I, I, my, my, um, My, I don't even want to view, maybe, um, is that people tend to take care of their, I, I'm sorry I upset both of you, that wasn't my intention, it wasn't my intention at all. I'm just, uh, my thing is, is that people tend to take care of their own, right, in, in that sense. So, my, and my point is, is that if, if 130 of our people in the legislation aren't from here, and you know maybe moved here the last five years, ten years, that they're not as interested. And maybe I'm wrong. I don't buy that a bit. You're wrong. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. You're okay. Wrong. I've been gone for a there long are, time. There are good ideas that come from outside of the state. Absolutely. As well. And we have. But, and 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 this is not just not just Bethel, not just Vermont, but it's nationally. Yeah. We are part of a global community and there are good ideas and good people all over the yeah. world and we're involved with them like it or not yeah absolutely. And there are good people whose families have been here for an excess of 250 years yeah. and those of us who fall in that group sometimes feel dismissed right. because the folks who came from outside are smarter 
and better I, and know, be, know more about what we should have. And I just don't think, I truly believe... But that's my feeling. That's I my feeling. You look up more handsome. I truly <laughs> believe that if Vermonters were running the state, you know, at least the majority of them, they would be concerned more about where their money is going. Vermonters are uh, running the state. Do you think just oh. because you're not born here, you're not a Vermonter? That's what you're saying. That is yeah. That's yeah. No, no. That is very repulsive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, no, sorry. Oh, I, 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 I agree. I, I, do you understand what I'm saying? Well, but I also. I'm sorry if I'm not. We're getting, we're we're getting derailed a little bit. Yeah, right. You're I, right. I'm it's sorry. Both, I'm not. Can we just read it both ways? Uh, on, on can we get back to school? Yeah. 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 On, on relevancy, yeah. you know, yeah. we talk about displaced peoples. I mean, we can I'm go sorry. back 400 years. You know, like, like we, you know, if we want to talk about a national interest. It's the same conversation in Wisconsin. Oh, the Chicago people are moving up. Right. It's the same conversation in Colorado. Oh, the okay. Texans are moving in. It's not helpful. All right, I'm It's sorry. not helpful to be divisive in geography or time or skin color. So in relevancy terms, you know, let, let's, let's look back at what, what the purpose is here. I have a question about the, um, the Supreme Court precedent. Because that case, the 2022 case, yep. Uh, the narrow issue was um, religion. You know, not versus, I can't hear you. The narrow issue was religion. Yeah. Not private schools in general. So we're, we can distinguish that from the Vermont case, which I'm, you're saying is a constitutional, is there, and I'm not as clear on that I don't that think one. you can distinguish it. You, it. The Supreme Court case was on religious grounds. But John Ross, Justice Roberts said... You do not have to support private schools. You do not have to do that, all right, with state money. But if you support private schools, then you must support religious schools. That's what the Supreme okay, Court I, I thought that it was exclusively a no. religious school. If you support private <coughs> yeah, schools, okay. then no, you must support Maine, religious schools. Maine had the same, had the same That's law Maine as law. we did. So with, the, conundrum, with, the conundrum comes in with our state's constitution, yeah. with the compelled support clause, which says the citizens cannot be compelled to support a religious institution. So the Supreme Court says if you give it to the private schools, you must give it to religious schools. Our state constitution says you can't give it to religious schools. There's only one path forward. We have to stop giving money to private schools. Everything else is unconstitutional. How they come to that is going to be another thing. But the fact is, yeah. when, you, when you sort it all out, our, our funding of private schools with public money has done three things. It's created a, a system that discriminates, segregates, and misuses public funds. And it needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. and, and don't take my arguments personally. You're just my conduit back to Montpelier. Oh, I know. <laughs> and yeah. I get within five miles of Montpelier, my blood ch pressure changes. <laughs> and by the way, I, I agree with I, you, I, I, as you know. I quite frankly have lost faith in the state of Vermont. I, I used to have great confidence in the state of Vermont. But the reality is you completely mismanaged the state teacher's pension fund. You completely mismanaged the employee, uh, the employee, municipal employees pension fund. Think of the percentage of people that lived in this state, and you've jeopardized their future because, not you personally, but the, I, but the state has mismanaged their pension fund, all right? Mm -hmm. The EB-5 program was nothing but a, a complete disgrace, all right? And the state was found to be negligent by the, by the court up in Lamoille County. The only reason the damage claim didn't go through the roof, the jurors there weren't going to give a large damage claim when the money was going to go to rich people out of the country. So I, I appreciate their, th them on that one. Lake Champlain's been trashed. I'm sorry. I, I have no confidence in the state. I used to have full confidence in the state of Vermont, but I, I've lost my confidence, quite frankly. You know, with the state college system being destroyed, the, what, what we're promoting with our private schools, we, we need a reset button, big time. And there's only 640,000 people in the whole state. We can't afford to be all things to everybody, but well, we seem to think we can. Right. If, we, if we had a full-time uh, legislature, that would be helpful, but that would cost more money. Well, that's cost more. <laughs> May I make a, just one point that, that Kirk alluded to? And I'm to. only here for about 10 more minutes. Okay. And to just one point that Kirk alluded to. Yeah. Because we're a small state and it's easy to get, we're, it's less expensive to come here and fight national fights in Vermont than it is in California to try to get major legislation stuff done in California, New York, or any of these big states. You can come and bring your high-priced lawyers 
and all your money, and you can go into Vermont legislature and and get the, these things on the ballot. And that's why they want to turn Vermont. Uh, I'm not going to name yeah. parties, but they bring these suits to Vermont because it's cheaper to to turn Vermont. It's easier to turn Vermont into into Alabama than it is it is California into Alabama. And, 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 and that's part, that's part of that's why these fights are here. I I agree with you. And like the school system, being from Bethel, I used to know all the teachers. I could win and talk with the teachers. And and get the best education, and and the same with you know I can, you know I can go I can get to talk to the governor if I want to yep. in the state of Vermont. I used to think that was a was a great thing, Doesn't but matter. we can't. It's it's we're fighting against outside forces that that take away our Vermont, with however you define and, and Vermonters. Ability to do what's right, and there's Thank a hidden agenda of some of these outside forces. I think there are people that want to overtly undermine our public school system. They want to do it with vouchers, so that the vouchers, you know, they say, well, the money follows the student, and and so I think what they want to do, their hidden agenda, is to fund their religious schools with taxpayer money and let the public school system do whatever happens to them. I can't see, we can't do that in Vermont, because, fortunately, because of our Constitution. I think we have the opportunity to refocus ourselves with our private, our, our public money going to public schools and, and doing that. Our, our schools are dilapidated, they need to be fixed. The state hasn't done anything to help a school's infrastructure. I don't think since 2008, 2007, about, years, yeah. about that long, we haven't done anything to help schools with their infrastructure. And we need to refocus our dollars just on us. and. And, and have the best public school system we can have. I, I, I don't see where that's such a radical approach, quite frankly. Well, it's not. It's just who can move on the ground. You know, it's like, it's like the Sharon Academy saw a niche and, and said, hey, you know, there's all these high schools closing and we can provide an education and we're going to consolidate. And, and they're, what, 25% public now. 80% publicly funded. 80% publicly funded. On their website. The right. front of their website says we're 80% right. public. I submit that's not an independent right. school. That's a dependent school. Yeah. And then the, the problem is at the same time we're saying, oh, we're paying too much on property taxes, but we have to be willing to pay more if we're going to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to increase our education uh, management and allocation uh, you know, towards buildings. Um, if we're going to come up with public solutions, great. Um, but, we've got but I'm not sure we would have to pay more if we stopped giving the money to the private schools. If that money came back to us, think about what would happen in this community. Our enrollment would go up, our cost per pupil would go down, our, and our tax rate would go down because you get money from the state on a per pupil basis. Who would I talk to to get these, all these conversations into numbers? You mean to get the actual data? No, I'm like, like I, I agree with what Greg said, yeah. and, I, and absolutely, but I'm, I think I'm smart enough to know that when I go to your group, I got to come in and say, these are the dollars that you're spending. These are the dollars that can be saved. Yep. These are the kids that can be educated. All these things have to be in numbers. Yeah, and uh, I, honestly, I think Rebecca Holcomb is your person, uh, but for a couple reasons. Of course, she was, she was. Uh, she and I don't get along at all. Okay. <laughs> when, we, when we sat I can talk to Rebecca. <laughs> when, when we sat down to work for the consolidation here in Bethel. Yeah. And we wanted to we wanted to break because we had to do we had to consolidate the Windsor Northwest and then we had to consolidate with what she said sucks to be you yeah and I said, whoa yeah but yeah but she does she does agree with you on this issue and uh, um, and so and, and, and so for a couple of reasons one because of her position her former position at the agency of education she she has you know knowledge and, and experience and knows. Where all those numbers are hidden, and second I'll bury, of all, I'll bury the hatchet. And, and second, <laughs> second of all, she is currently on the, I believe, appropriations committee, which is the money committee. Um, and so, so I mean, it's the money spending committee. So she's going to know where that money is going outward. Uh, I don't know what if they, the appropriations committee divides its members up into areas of specialty. I wouldn't be surprised if she, her specialty is education. I'm not sure. Uh, I know which which 
member on their committee has to do with economic development. <coughs> that's what I work with, but I don't know which one she works on. But, um, but I, I think Rebecca is probably going to be a great place to start, and if she doesn't know the answer, she'll know where you can get the answer. Can I, can I just before you leave, Yeah. can we get, Greg, get a commitment from you to work on his issue starting now to get all the people that, or that you can communicate with at yeah. the legislature now to be ready for the next year to work on this. In the meantime, work with Mr. McCormick and the other two, uh, two senators from Windsor County to be ready to have the same matching bill to come up in the Senate at the same time next year rather than try to fix what's broken Let's make yeah. a new. Are you familiar with the bill that's in the House already? Which which one? There's a bill in the House. I think it's 250 H258, if I'm not mistaken, um, and it would provide that each town would have to provide for up to three um, private schools to whom they could send tuition uh, from their town, and that would have to be a pub a, a, a public school, of course. Yeah. And so each town would then designate um, yep. either go to the sending school or three different alternatives, which would be a public school, and then the family would choose which alternative school they would go to. And these alternative schools, by the way, what's carved out in this legislation is the four traditional academies yep. and the public schools plus therapeutic schools. So when people come up, well, my, my child really needs to go here for these specials, that, that's fine. They can go there. What we're talking about is these quasi-public yep. schools getting private yep. money. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know what ever came of that bill because uh, that uh, that came in last year, last session, um, uh, and uh, but I know that I had a lar large for Hancock um, um, cr uh, number of people last year at their town meeting who who absolutely hated that bill uh, and uh, because. Because the way that bill is written, you know those potential schools that you can send have to be within a 25-mile radius, uh, and a number of them send their kids to Sharon Academy, and um, and so it's outside of that 25-mile radius for them, and they hated it. Uh, so um, yeah, but, but Sharon Academy wouldn't be an option in this new bill. I know. I don't know why they would hate it, but. You know, because Hancock, because but, <clears throat> Sharon Academy wouldn't be included. That's why they hate it. <laughs> they want to send their kids there. And, and, uh, <laughs> so, 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 so somebody from Hancock, you know, they go over to Middlebury sometimes. They go up to Harwood sometimes. They can go to Rochester if they want to. They have options, and Hancock can designate yep. three options. Well, I know, but they, but, but as they clearly stated to me, they knew they had those options, and they want to send their kids to Sharon Academy. There's so, a bus well, that well, runs from the, Hancock yes, to Sharon I'm Academy. <laughs> It's a, it's a constitutional I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying, not every. That's when I say I agree with you, but but there will be pushback from the other side because there are there are people, plain regular old. You know, not I don't think there's many. Can, what we were talking any, just Hancock kids that go to Sharon County, maybe Rochester, but not Hancock. Uh, I mean, I I actually have the number somewhere, um, and. And no, it's not a lot. I mean, Hancock is population 300, so they don't have that many, that many I, students I to begin with. That they take, uh, they have to get them to Rochester. But but I believe I believe something like six of their kids go to Sharon Academy, and they only have like 10 kids, something like that. So I'd it's, like to see those numbers, but I think yeah. most of them anyway, that's I, I agree. And, you know, well, well, that's a good example of six kids that would have to go to a private public school, yeah. not a private school, and it would lower our taxes. Yeah, yeah, big so, time. Uh, I. Yeah, and, and I, like I said, uh, to go back to Scott's original question, yes, um, and a, as I said, I mean, I was already planning on working with Rebecca on this over the summer, so um, uh, so we will, I, I, I will commit to, to working on this and uh, with Rebecca, seeing if we can get get the legislators uh, involved and, uh, yeah, the, I mean, not the legislators, the senators, said this Senate, it's its own interesting animal, uh, and uh, uh, so yeah. But, uh, but again, now is the time to recruit other people that feel the same way as yeah. you are, understanding that this is what you're going to be working on, and and again, you got to get to Senate. Yeah. And yeah. Mr. McCormick is going to be gone. Yeah. 
but um, I'm trying? sure that Clarkson, mm -hmm. so Clarkson is um, very receptive to to talk to. I can talk to her. Yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, Get those if we were people. still talking to find benefits clause, we'd pay pit pat patty pat for another 50 years and we'd never change it. The Constitution mandate has put this on the front burner and quite frankly, there's really no wiggle room. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. That's, uh, that's and, and, yeah. Which is why I think which is why I think this year uh, I mean, basically the agency of education has just said we're not gonna think about it. And that's and that has been their their strategy this year, and so that's why and that's why uh, some of us are saying no. Okay, we need to we need to make them that this needs to actually come up, and we need to make a bill. We need to we need to push this along because because their answer is, you know, they feel like they're in a between a rock and a hard place, and they aren't going to make a choice. Uh, and but of course, making no choice is making a choice, choice. and uh, and so. So the rock is the Constitution, and the hard place is the, the constituents that want to be senator <laughs> It's the private school. Yeah, yeah, sort of. So that's 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 how that stands. Um, but yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm happy to to like I said, we'll we'll start working on it. Um, I would love to be informed. Yeah. If there's any time that you guys are meeting that uh, public would be that I would be able to attend, even if I just sit there and listen. Sure, I'll I'll try to. I mean, I I think the the reality of it is. I mean, I can start to get people to to commit to working on a thing, but I don't think any work's going to happen till summer. Uh, just I mean, okay, right. you know, st starting starting this week, you know, some of you know my my legislative hours, not the legislative hours I'm being paid for. Legislative hours I'll be putting in will 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 probably be starting at. Eight in the morning and going till ten o'clock at night, uh, you know, in Montpelier. Uh, it, it, there might be some exceptions, but we're at that we're at that point now where, where, bills are coming to the house floor and they get to down the road. We need, we need those hours to be on education funding next year. <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I I, I I said to the last meeting we had. I said, you know, don't come up with with two hundred new laws. Take the ones we got and work on them. Yeah. Don't, don't get so diversified that you can't spend the necessary time, my, my opinion, the necessary time on a bill. Maybe, maybe that's, that's all you do this year. That's all you do is education, spending. Yeah, I mean, that would... That's a big, that's a huge deal to 90% yeah. of Vermonters. The education of the children, how it's going to be funded, you solve that one, and a lot of the other problems will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. So I've thank you. I've picked my day job, uh, and uh, so. But thank you for for coming. Well, well thank you, Lewis. Yeah. And, uh, so. Nothing personal. Yeah. yeah no, I know. I for oh, I know. With my big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing I, think, I, I didn't say anything about it, I'm going to say now is your kids, your kids, your kids, yes, they want to go somewhere. Yeah, but it wasn't, and I just, and I,